Part 1. The director of an engineering company is interviewing an applicant for a job. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Ah, good morning. It's Mr Robinson, isn't it? Have a seat. Stephen Robinson. Yes. Is that S-T-E-V-E-N or P-H? It's V. OK. I've got your letter of application, but I need a few more details for the file. Now, you're from Manchester. What exactly is the address? Uh, yes, it's Dynevor Gardens. That's D-Y-N-E-V-O-R, Presswich. Thanks. And telephone? Oh, well, it isn't mine. It's the landlord's, but I can be contacted. It's 483250. Aha. Uh -huh. The landlord lives in, does he? Well, he has the flat downstairs, and he's a friend of the family, anyway. I see. OK. According to your letter, I imagine you were born in, uh, let me see, 1960? 61. Right. And the date? 12th of July. Thank you. And I believe you're married. Oh, no, no, I'm getting married, but not for a few months. Oh, sorry. Well, I mean, congratulations. Is it going to be in Manchester? Oh, well, no, actually. My fiance is from Wales, so we're getting married in her home village, near Bangor. Oh, how nice. Now, as you know, when you apply for a post with Williams Engineering, we need to find out a few things about both your academic background and more recent work experience, the latter being especially important in respect of this rather specialised position in the area of water management. First of all, A-levels. Yes, I've got three. Geography, maths and physics. Geography, maths and physics. OK. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And what about your degree? I went to Sheffield University and got an engineering degree with water management as my specialisation. Uh -huh. And as for work experience, I started out after graduating in 1986 in China, working for the Chinese government. Did you work as a volunteer? No, I, I did get a nominal salary. It was a two-year irrigation project. That sounds fascinating. How did you organise that? You say it wasn't a British company, then? No, no. My university had links with a Chinese engineering university, so it was organised at that level. And after that? Then I came back, moved to Manchester, and have been working with Latimer Engineering since then. And what exactly are you doing for Latimer? Oh, I'm working in irrigation again, this time as a project research assistant. Great. I've got your details. Now let's move on to a more general discussion about what we're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a podcast on Camber's theme park. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16.
Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to Canvas Park Podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Canvas offers more than other theme parks. Like them, we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages, but Canvas also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors. Not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel. Set in 80 acres of beautiful countryside, about three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulchester. The park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers has over 45 different rides, exhibits, and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about £8 per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, which entitles you to 50% off ticket prices all year round, and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the Offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park, and we're particularly proud of our Future Farm Zone, which houses over 20 different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted, and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open 10 to 5.30 all year round, and cold drinks and snacks can be bought at any time during opening hours. And hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from 11 until 5 just half an hour before closing time. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now we want all our visitors to have an exciting time when they come to the park, but our first priority must be safety. Parents and guardians know their children's behaviour and capabilities, but here at the park we have set certain conditions for each of the rides to ensure that all visitors get the maximum enjoyment out of the experience and feel secure at all times. There are four major rides at the park. Our newest ride is the River Adventure, which is designed to reproduce the experience of white water rafting. No amount of protective clothing would make any difference, so only go on this ride if you're prepared to get wet. Children under eight can go on this ride, but all under 16s must have an adult with them. Not all of our rides are designed for thrills and spills. Our Jungle Gym roller coaster is a gentler version of the classic Loop the Loop, specially created for whole family enjoyment, 
from the smallest children to elderly grandparents, suitable for all levels of disability and health conditions. Carriages have comfortable seating for up to eight people with safety belts for each passenger, which must be worn at all times. Sit back and enjoy the scenery. One of the best established and most popular of Camber's rides is the massive swoop slide. Whiz down the polished vertical slide nine meters in height and scream to your heart's content. There are no age or height restrictions. Be careful, though. You must have on long trousers so you won't get any speed burns. And then there's the famous Zip Go Kart Stadium with 16 carts, eight for single drivers and eight for kids preferring to ride along with mom, dad, or carer. Take part in high speed races in our specially designed Formula One style carts. But no bumping other carts, please. All riders must be above 1.2 meters because they have to be able to reach the pedals, even in the shared carts. Full details of all safety features are available on our website at www.canvaspark.com. So come and make a day of it at Canvas Theme Park. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing a project they have to do as part of a literature course on great books. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? I heard you were sick. Oh, hi, Olivia. Yeah, I had a virus last week, and I missed a whole pile of lectures, like the first one on the great books in literature, where Dr. Castle gave us all the information about the semester project. I can give you copies of the handouts. I've got them right here. But that's okay. I already collected the handouts, but I'm not very clear about all the details. I know we each have to choose an individual author. I think I'm going to do Carlos Castaneda. I'm really interested in South American literature. Have you checked he's on the list that Dr. Castle gave us? We can't just choose anyone. Yeah, I checked. It's okay. Who did you choose? Well, I was thinking of choosing Ernest Hemingway, but then I thought, no, I'll do a British author, not an American one. So I chose Emily Bronte. Okay. And first of all, it says we have to read a biography of our author. I guess it's okay if we just look up information about him on the Internet? No, it's got to be a full-length book. I think the minimum length's 250 pages. There's a list of biographies. Didn't you get that? Oh, right. I didn't realize we had to stick with that. So what do we have to do when we've read the biography? Well, then we have to choose one work by the writer. Again, it's got to be something quite long. We can't just read a short story. But I guess a collection of short stories would be okay? Yes, or even a collection of poems, they said. But I think most people are doing novels. I'm going to do Wuthering Heights. I've read it before, but I really want to read it again now I've found out more about the writer. And then the video. We have to make a short video about our author and about the book. How long has it got to be? A minute. What? Like 60 seconds? And we got to give all the important information about their life and the book we choose? <laughs> well, you can't do everything. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes, 
Dr. Castle said we had to find or write a short passage that helps to explain the author's passion for writing, why they're a writer. So we can back this up with reference to important events in the writer's life, if they're relevant. But it's up to us, really. The video's meant to portray the essence of the writer's life and the piece of writing we choose. So when we read the biography, we have to think about what kind of person our writer is. Yes, and the historical context and so on. So for my writer, Emily Bronte, the biography gave a really strong impression of the place where she lived and the countryside around. Right. I'm beginning to get the idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Uh, can I check the other requirements with you? Sure. The handout said after we'd read the biography, we had to read the work we'd chosen by our author and choose a passage that's typical in some way, that typifies the author's interests and style. Yes, but at the same time, it has to relate to the biographical extract you choose, there's got to be some sort of theme linking them. Okay, I'm with you. And then you have to think about the video. So are we meant to dramatize the scene we choose? I guess we could, but there's not a lot of time for that. I think it's more how we can use things like sound effects to create the atmosphere, the feeling we want. And presumably visuals as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, I suppose that's the whole point of making a video. But whatever we use has to be historically in keeping with the author. We can use things like digital image processing to do it all. So we can use any computer software we want. Sure. And it's important that we use a range, not just one software program. That's actually one of the things we're assessed on. Okay. Oh, and something else that's apparently really important is to keep track of the materials we use and to acknowledge them. Including stuff we download off the internet, presumably? Yeah, so our video has to list all the material used with details of the source in a bibliography at the end. Okay, and you were talking about assessment of the project. Did they give us the criteria? I couldn't find anything on the handout. Sure, he gave us them in the lecture. Let's see, you get 25% just for getting all the components done. That's both sets of reading and the video. Then the second part is actually how successful we are at getting the essence of the work. They call that content, and that counts for 50%. Then the last 25% is on the video itself, the artistic and technical side. Great. Well, that sounds a lot of work, but a whole lot better than just handing in a paper. But thanks a lot, Olivia. You're welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about a place called Kuba Pedi. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Listen carefully 
and answer questions 31 to 36. Good afternoon. Today, we're continuing this series of talks on the development of the Australian outback with a look at Cooba Pedy, the desert town of opal mines and underground living, which lies 860 kilometres north of Adelaide and 690 south of Alice Springs. The inaccessibility, harsh climate and almost total lack of water made it a highly unlikely place for human habitation. But that all started to change in 1915 with the discovery there of opals, the precious stones which seemed to change colour according to their surroundings. Settlements were established following the First World War when soldiers returning from the trenches of France brought with them the techniques of living below ground in dugouts. The depression of the 1920s and 30s led to many prospectors leaving, but the town boomed again in the late 1940s when shallow new opal fields were discovered and immigrants from Europe arrived in large numbers after the Second World War. It must be remembered, though, just how hostile conditions were. Daytime summer temperatures reached well over 50 degrees centigrade, winter nights were bitterly cold, and dense dust storms regularly blanketed the town. To cope with this, more and more people began living in disused mines and purpose-built subterranean houses, where the temperature remains at a comfortable 25 degrees all year round, so that eventually around 70% of the town's inhabitants had made their homes beneath the surface. This led to the construction of hotels and even churches below ground, as well as an entire underground shopping centre, the only one in the world. Now answer questions 37 to 40. Perhaps not surprisingly, this has now led to the emergence of a secondary industry, tourism. Increasing numbers of visitors come to see the tunnels and the caves with their ventilation shafts, the weird machines lying about in the town, and just beyond it in the scorched red desert, the conical hills thrown up by the world's biggest opal mines. It's a logical stopping place for travellers too. The nearest town to Cooper Pedy is Woomera, in the prohibited area once used for launching space rockets. But even that is an enormous distance away. Within the town itself, there are plenty of hotel rooms and a number of ethnic restaurants. Remember that Cooper Pedy is one of the most multicultural places in Australia, with an estimated 45 nationalities represented and its very own Opal Museum. A short distance from town, there's a section of the enormous barrier that runs thousands of kilometres across the country. The Dingo Fence, which is meant to keep these predatory wild dogs out of the sheep farming areas. Another attraction just outside town are the sets of various films made there, including Mad Max 3, as well as The Red Planet, and Until the End of the World, names that reflect the harshness of the terrain and temperatures there. The name Cuba Pedy, incidentally, comes from an Aboriginal expression meaning white man's hole in the ground. Next, I'd like to go on to talk about Broken Hill, another mining town, but one that... That is the end of part four.